everyone. Uh, certainly looks like this didn't start well. Uh, uh, but I actually do want to talk about last year. Because last year I was talking here about the relatively mundane subject of psychological operations. And this being such an exciting event, and especially since the audience, every one of you, is so educated, I get pretty hyped up. And uh, so after the presentation, I got all of the gear off and, and answered the questions. I head out, of course, for the bar. This young man comes up to me and pretty innocently asks that, um, now, with, now that we have elected Mr. Trump and everything that happened during that campaign, what do you think that should be done? And I, it was only two months after the election day, and it was about 10 days before he took the office, so we didn't know a lot that we know now. But I still should have recognized how, what's the gravity of that question, how big question that was. But I didn't. I was on overdrive, so I just started babbling out. And it takes a minute or two before I realize what I'm doing, and, and when I, I'm not making any sense at that point, and I apologize and uh, state how big the question is, and um, maybe just say that, you know, you would really need to think about this for a while. And I'm not sure if you, Mr. Young Man, are with us today, but here we go. How to save democracy. And, you know, I'm Topia Suatila, and you, read, you can reach me through with Twitter with that, that uh, identity. So the question is still huge, and I think it's one of the most important questions the society is facing at the moment. It's not, you know, uh, climate change, but it's on the second tier. And I can't offer you a full solution, but we're, what we're trying to do today is go through what I think is the underlying problem, and it's, it's sort of even bigger. And then I will present a case of Cambridge Analytica, uh, and how that sort of tells us how political marketing works uh, currently. And then we're looking at this technique called emotional triggering, how that works. And then I hope to give a few practical tips to each individual on how to cope in this environment. Because uh, otherwise we're moving on a very abstract level. So let's start from the top. What has truth meant throughout history. If we go back to the time of the pharaohs uh, or the medieval kings, truth and power in a political context were pretty much inseparable. So if you wanted to say that the pharaoh was wrong, it didn't matter if you were right, you needed to have more power. And if you had more power, then the pharaoh didn't need to be lying to begin with. So might made right. Only when we started building societies uh, after the Renaissance and, and the Enlightenment, uh, and we had the separation of powers in states, uh, the truth started to matter something. And then we entered the golden age of journalism. Because these three branches of government, one of them is, is, is so key to be held accountable. The accountability of government is such a fundamental uh, characteristic of a modern state that you can't achieve that without the free press. So this change happened around the year 1700. The first newspapers were uh, started in the 1600s and then during that century uh, they started actively following on the political decision making process. But this of course uh, wasn't the full solution. Many of these uh, newspapers uh, were operating in a market where they're pretty much alone so they couldn't keep checks on each other. And a journalist can't be that perfect that they would know everything about everything. So even if you go back to like 10 years and think about yourself reading a newspaper article, if you're an expert on that matter, the article always has multiple errors. So it wasn't, you know, perfect. Now, we had a good moment, what I like to call a moment of promise. And while somebody would say that it was just social media that brought this, I think it started before. And I would you know, like to highlight Netscape Navigator, because uh, that brought the internet to the masses. And then finally, we got uh, unlimited competition in the media landscape. And more importantly, uh, we got the opportunity for everyone to comment on, on uh, mainstream media articles. 
and propose corrections and, and you know, sign out or, or point those faults that the articles had. And uh, this, of course, made the uh, journalism look worse, like testing always does. But at the same time, it actually improved that quality to a, to a better level than ever. Unfortunately, like most of the promises of the internet, like a you know, fully connected world village, this didn't really uh, materialize. And, and the first challenge that we got was something that I like to call the rampage of ruthlessness. So some persons realized that actually the truth does not always prevail, and you don't really need to care so much about the tr truth. You can simply be ruthless and do whatever you want to. And a prime example here is the annexation of Crimea, where Russians basically invaded another country, and then they knew they were going to get caught. And I think that's a key difference to previous lies, that during the Cold War, for example, you didn't ever want to get caught of lying. But here they knew they were going to get caught. They just didn't care. They were ruthless. And in a couple of months, they started handing out medals to those soldiers that best performed during this invasion. Now, the society and all the democratic processes, and, and you need to remember that at the same time that we build this journalism and, and, and the truth in the political context, we were also building the scientific tru truth and the system of academia and universities. These could have survived this stage, I'm pretty sure. But some people, and in some cases it's the same people, looked at this case and similar cases and decided that, hey, this temporary confusion, that sounds promising. Why don't we make the confusion an objective in itself? So behold, the land of confusion. Now, just a couple of months after the, uh, after the annexation thing, uh, Russia was heavily involved in the, in the catastrophe or, or the crime where the flight MH17 was shut down. And uh, they basically reacted by, by generating so many alternative you know, theories of what might have happened that could be sort of a possibility that they started to really employ this confusion as an end state. We're just trying to get as many people not to believe in anything. And at the same time, of course, anytime you come up with a new theory and you have a large population, someone always believes that. But a good example is really here on, on, on the slide. So on the same date, the embassy, which is a really official organization, tweets two theories about a single incident that are simply incontable, uh, that they simply cannot be true at the same time. However, I think uh, the Russian system uh, or the society is in a state where they, have, they don't need to perfect this method. And uh, so our protagonist, Mr. Trump, has been, been going sort of way beyond that thing. And, and, and now we're, because he had to postpone that deadline, we're, we're still waiting which, which media outlets will get the most dishonest and corrupt media awards of the year. That will, I think, be on the 18th, so next, next week. So he's basically attacking all other organizations that have any credibility and trying to undermine that credibility everywhere, thus creating a, a true land of confusion. And personally, I cannot follow what is happening in the US anymore through media because I don't have a personal contact there. And it's, it's very, very hard to get any sense of those uh, events. And this, this attack is, is also like it's, uh, visible on, on this tweet. It's also about coining new terms and going like full 1984 with, with, with new terminology like fake news and alternative facts, which are you know, just misnomers. They don't mean anything except add to the confusion. Now, it's easy to think that this is just a problem of this, the countries I've mentioned, but I think it's happening everywhere. At least it's happening in Finland. Uh, you need to remember that during the past year, year and a half, uh, the president of Finland has uh, commented on a draft paper uh, commissioned by a governmental organization and, and singled that thing to be trolling. And the defense minister of Finland has picked up a news item by the public broadcasting company, so basically the government's radio, and singled that out as fake news. So we're not immune. 
And what, why this is such a big challenge to the society is that this is really seeping uh, elsewhere from the journalistic and the political realm, and we're really seeing also a distrust in the research institutions, in academia, and so on. And then, why I think we're not able to self-correct this is that this is a very interesting, very lucrative proposal for those in power, and that is um, embodied in this slogan that sort of describes this, this state that we're in. Nothing is true and everything is possible. At face value, it's pretty trivial. If you have no established facts, all the alternatives are still possible. That's, that's trivial. But from a point of view of an of a, uh, uh, entity in power, of a powerful decision maker, it's just not that all the alternatives about what has happened are possible. As long as there are no established facts, any action is possible and any achievement is still achievable. So I'm thinking that they have very little incentive of, of letting go of this position. Now, how could we turn back time? How could we make journalism great again? Uh, probably it's not that straightforward. And the problem we have is that we wrecked their economic model at the same time, that the promise of the, of the, uh, the moment of promise, the promise of the internet, at the same time wrecked the business model of the journalism institution. So, so there is no turning back to. And, and this problem is such that it cannot be corrected by just inserting more money, because these sort of problems, a money from a single source, corrupts the solution. So how about these guys that took the money, like Facebook and Google, maybe they will fix this. Uh, I don't really see the incentives there. There might be, but what I think is the really sort of sad uh, data point is that these are not really new companies. They're like 20, 10-year-old companies. They, they didn't just happen yesterday. And all of this, uh, this path that we're in has been happening while they existed. So the track record is really, really bad. However, like I mentioned, I do have a solution space. And like I also mentioned, we could have gone with an even bolder title, uh, but I didn't. So I'm not saying that this is like, like exhaustive, that we need to do all of this. I'm not saying this is complete, so that there wouldn't be actions outside this. But here are some of the areas we can look at to fix the state that we're in. For example, when we look at our political and electoral processes, uh, there's a good, a good example in France where they have a sort of campaigning silent period before the election. That's a pretty good idea. Maybe we should take that up. And what we definitely should not do is that when we're in a crisis of truth and trustworthiness, uh, we cannot undermine that with gimmicks such as simply going to electronic voting, which would you know, further undermine the trust that we have in the, in the elections. Then we definitely need to look at regulation. I'm not a big fan of, of regulation, but, but uh, there's a good discussion on net neutrality. But I think the net neutrality of ISPs is sort of like, that's a bit like a historical thing. Probably it should keep that. But uh, what I'm more interested in, in, in is that we're now in Europe, in the US, we're regulating social media platforms in a very point-wise fashion. So there's this one thing that you need to uh, weed out from the platform. There's this thing you need to do, and there's that thing you need to do. While we maybe would be more better off uh, with a net neutrality type of approach to that. And uh, the sort of the thinking behind is that, that uh, net neutrality is, is about prioritized lanes or roads. And what do prioritized roads mean if all the roads lead to Rome anyway? If everybody is just going to Facebook, what does it matter if the roads are prioritized or not? So on a more technical level than the next part, uh, while it's, it's a lot about lying and generating alternative facts, uh, these will be automated. Artificial intelligence will generate most of the lies in the future. 
Now, if you have a good, good command of, of AI technologies, uh, please contribute on the solution side and, and help bring that AI into fact-checking and content filtering. Uh, we're going to need more models on how research institutions and media and other parties that are really sort of dependent on the uh, good being of truth, how they cooperate. And we're definitely going to need more business model innovations in, in the area of media so that we would actually have businesses that profitable heavily uh, from the spread of truth rather than just evoking emotions or, or so on. What I do personally a lot is, is education in this area. I like to call knowledge security. Uh, it's a term I invented, so probably not have heard about that. But we're running a ser series of courses on, on the uh, national defense uh, organization called MPK. Uh, the next course is on 24th of March, so please join us. Uh, and this, of course, is, is part of such effort to, to help you to understand the world we're in. And. Uh, one thing that I would expect even more from this audience is that you guys and girls have a lot of understanding on cybersecurity, information security, and how those technologies work. A lot of the work that we do in that domain and a lot of the talks we have here is about confidentiality from an access point of view. What we're needing in this context is, is more about availability and integrity from a content point of view. So for example, how can we make sure that, that when something is truth or truthful, that is identifiable, it's unalternable, and, and, and it's findable, it's available to the, to the public. And for example, could we build innovations on, for example, the blockchain on how we keep, publicly keep track of uh, journalistic citations and references. But the thing we're focusing on today is the uh, process side and, and then the Knozek side. And next, we're going to talk about the company called Cambridge Analytica. Now, about 10 months ago, uh, there were a couple of lengthy articles that were very exciting about how Cambridge Analytica did this innovation called micro-targeting. And this micro-targeting was, was the thing that was breaking democracy. And I hope that I already convinced you that there's maybe a bit sort of larger picture than just this one technique. But let's look at what actually is the, the innovation of Cambridge Analytica. Now, every effort in communication, every effort in marketing basically does ST and P. They segment the audience, they choose a target, and then they position the message. And uh, targeting is just selecting who do you talk to. Now, I, might have, I may have another target for this, so maybe some sort of uh, more general audience than what sort of is common to you guys and girls. Uh, but basically just selecting to be here, I've made a targeting decision. And micro-targeting simply means that the target audience is not like hundreds or thousands of people, it's a couple of people or maybe an individual. And uh, while it's a you know, powerful technique, it, ha it has been used in the corporate world in the early 90s and it has been used even in the US presidential elections already in the 2004 Bush campaign. So it's not a new innovation. However, I would like to still talk more about that because there were some cool tricks that they did in that area. Uh, there are two problems, two things that make micro-targeting difficult. The other thing is that if you have like 100 million voters, how are you going to have 100 million different kind of conversations? Just executing those conversations and those messages is really hard. And the other part is that if you have those discussions, what are you going to talk about? How do you understand your audience when the audience is just one person? And the first part, the number of conversations, the solution starts with the concept called swing states. So uh, in the US system, uh, the states are decided one by one. So basically, uh, some states, such as usually, for example, Texas, it is pretty clear that it goes to the Republicans. Uh, and nobody needs to campaign there anymore, not the Republicans or the Democra Democrats, because they know that it's already decided. So they focus on these lightly colored states, uh, where they still can sort of swing the state to either direction. So that cuts down us from like 100 million to 20 million a large help. 
Then they look inside those states and they focus on swing voters. So if you, on the other side, you've got all of those persons who are certainly voting for Trump, and on the other side, you have those people who are definitely voting for Hillary. You have people in the between who have not yet decided. Of course, you focus on those people. And this, you know, is another 80% reduction. So you go from 100 million to 4 million conversations, which is, of course, a huge difference. Now, the other problem is, is what to talk about in a political campaign. And that has traditionally been solved by surveys. So you take a random sample of a couple of thousand persons. You ask questions about what's important. How do you view the world? Blah, blah, blah. What's your values? And then you find those themes that are, are very uh, common and you talk about those. But that doesn't really work when you're talking to an individual because there is no guarantee that even though 40% of the population thinks a certain way, uh, that individual will, will sort of be interested in that same topic. And you can think of this as an analogy from, from like geography that, that if you would randomly sample uh, 5,000 locations in the United States, you would get a certain no, no, number of forests and, and mountains and rivers and so on. It, it gives a good picture of, of how the country looks as a total, but then if you go into a specific location, that doesn't really, really tell anything about the location. And like I wrote in an article was that there simply are no mountains in New York. Um, and here's a lesson to all of us. Uh, there actually are mountains in New York, and none of the 700 persons that have read the article have said anything about that. True, there are no mountains in New York City, but you know, we really have a, not that much knowledge about mountains. So what they did, and this is, I think, the first really innovative stuff, is that they scrapped the whole notion of surveys. They said, OK, screw these surveys. Let's get the data on everybody. Let's not do like a sample. Let's just ask from everybody how they think. What's important to you? How do you think? What's your psychological profile? And, and so on. And let's get those 4 million or, or 20 million profiles. And how to do that? You put quizzes on Facebook. Hey, do you want to know what your leadership style is? Which uh, Disney character you are? Do you want to forecast how your marriage is going to look like? Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to click all these questions that describe my personality and give that data to Facebook and the company that made that quiz. And, you know, a very cool solution. Uh, and probably that wouldn't be that harmful. However, as we were talking about practical tips, uh, don't do those inside Facebook, just, you know, log out. <laughs> and uh, if you do those, just use like an incognito mode on the browser, because they're not really trying to hack you, so you don't need to be like behind seven proxies as the seven saying goes. Just, you know, just don't give them, readily give the, your psychological profile to other people. But I think the innovation that the, both the Brexit campaign and the Trump campaign had, uh, and Cambridge Analytica was helping both of those campaigns, or maybe the main contractor in those campaigns, was that they sort of realized that, that the way to use this information uh, is to target this other swing segment, which is here. Those that were almost certainly voting for Hillary, but let's make them not vote at all. And the way to do this is, is loops back to what we were talking about, the truth in general. So by confusion and by lies, and by a technique called emotional triggering. Uh, and you could say that the innovation of these two election campaigns, it does not lie with Cambridge Analytica, it is lies. So I mentioned the emotional triggering. Let's move on to the third part of the presentation. What are these things? Now, this mount might be like the mountains in New York that nobody has just, you know, corrected me because I'm not, you know, a trained psychiatrist or, or anything, but this is a model I drew about how, how I think that the mind works. In your head, you have a host of knowledge. It's usually like ever accumulating. You forget some things, but basically you learn more stuff. How to play the guitar, how to talk English, uh, what's your own name and whatever. And then you have values, which are like fundamental beliefs about the world. Like all men are created equal. Uh, private property is a human right, you, nobody should eat meat, whatever. 
and then you have constantly new information coming in. You're listening to a disobey talk, that's new information, new information, and an increasing high rate coming in. And, and how these interact with each other is that the knowledge acts as a filter to that new information. So the more radical the idea, the more it's against what you already know, the more likelihood it is that you will simply drop that and not believe it. And the more it's sort of according to what you already know, the more easier it, it gets inserted into the existing knowledge base. And if the knowledge base thus is, is shaped into a direction, if it starts to be at a mismatch with your values, you start to suffer personally. Uh, for example, if you're like a hardcore racist and then you constantly see that actually people from different backgrounds are all nice people, it, it starts to feel sort of bad. And you have two options. You either start to disregard some of the information you're getting, or then you change your values. And the latter is basically called growing up, and the former is becoming delusional. So I would healthily recommend growing up. Uh, so if a piece of information is emotional enough, it sort of hits your values and it hits these sort of predispositions called triggers, it can, can sort of become an emotional triggering event. And, and it sort of not just builds on that knowledge, but, but does something more to you. And, uh, and the trigger is then, then this uh, predisposition uh, that changes your attitude. An attitude is like a likelihood of committing certain kind of actions. And again, again that's a good example, so that, so that the person is, is, is racist and you sort of trigger them on, on, a, tori uh, on a talk about how how people of a different color, for example, are, are really bad people and they're doing something acutely uh, harmful and now you need to you know, be, do something. And they get angry and they become, their attitude becomes such that they're more prone to violence, for example. And that is then a probability of them uh, doing violent actions and hate crimes in, in, in this, this context. Luckily, we still have a thing called barriers in between, so anything that can stop those actions from happening. And while barriers could be like physical barriers or, or anything really concrete, the best example I can think of is, is of a barrier is that your mother is watching. There are so many things we will not do as uh, eagerly if our mom sees us doing that. Okay, so the attitude is usually a temporary thing. So you hit the trigger, the attitude spikes and then it dissipates. And uh, if that attitude is like a confusion or a re reluctance to vote, then cool, because it was the election day that you were triggered, and it doesn't really matter that on the next day you got to your senses. So, so it doesn't really help, and this is why I think the, the model in France is, is pretty cool. But if you keep triggering that same emotion, you sometimes also get to this B trajectory, uh, where the new state, the new attitude becomes sort of permanent. And another example of this that I can think of is that if your employer is unfair to you, like let's say three times during the spring, you're, that will, the feeling of injustice will probably be somewhat permanent, and you will start to look everything that the employer does through that lens and think that, that you're probably being swindled again. But now we know what those are. Uh, what can you do with those? Theoret theoretically, anything but it's very, very much harder to invoke complex behaviors. So uh, it is analogous to uh, this pyramid, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So it's usually easier to move on the lower rungs than, than on the upper ones. So like often cited reference is this, this violence against minorities type of thing. But you could you know, do some more complex stuff, for example, uh, a broad here, like recruiting spies by something like a story like your own country doesn't value you, nobody sees your potential, you're such a smart fellow, you can do anything if, you, if people would let you do and, and, and work with us and we can make great things happen and, and so on. And while this is just an example I made up, uh, during two decades, the 80s and the 90s, the main recruitment slogan for the US Army was be all that you can be. Well, anyway, the, uh, 
most common ones is, is, is you somehow disrupt the cohesion of, of a certain population. So you find these factions and try to pit them against each other. And maybe some populations don't really have factions, but almost every place has like a leader or an elite, and then that's the first faction you can identify. Like this elite should be made, uh, should be made to think that the people are, are dumb and, and they should be afraid of them, and the people should be thinking that they are being, you know, uh, robbed or whatever, and that's sort of a, a special case. And the usual story, the emotion is like fear. Like, for example, they're in the safety level, the red fear for security of body. Uh, immigrants are coming here to rape people. Security of employment, those same, same immigrants are stealing your jobs, uh, and so on. But you can also, like I mentioned last year, you can also use humor as a counter for fear. And then it sort of works quite well in, in these cases where you're trying to undermine the leadership part. So it's the leader against the people faction thing. And uh, uh, while I've talked about, a lot about Trump already, I think what we're seeing is that also uh, people opposing Trump are using this humor aspect as a leadership undermining uh, te technique. So let's say you've identified your own objective. You know that, yeah, it's an election I want to win. I need to have people voting this way. So that is the action. Uh, then you know which people. You know the target group. What else you need to know? You need to find the triggers of what, what, what would make these people not vote? Why, why would these people be at home? Uh, and that's, of course, very hard. Uh, I think what they used in the Trump campaign were, were things about uh, Hillary's Wall Street connections. Uh, some things about how he's actually, how she's not actually at all welcoming of minorities and, and seeding doubt on, on those kind of things. And then, you know, it's not just this thing that I told you. You really need to specify what is the actual information that you're delivering to those persons. Is it an article? Is it the video? Uh, how is it laid out? Everything about that, the final product, and finally, how you can deliver that piece of information. So is it the fa Facebook ad? Is it the YouTube ad? Is it the uh, TV campaign? How do you de deliver that to that people? And sort of disconnected, but two reminders. These target groups, they are not created. They're just found. They exist in the population as it is. And what you're actually creating is these crowds, people, of capable of, of collective action. And then another thing that makes this thing so much harder is that you really need to remember how the knowledge acts as a filter. So you need to talk to these people uh, about things that they already believe, at least partially in. OK, so maybe your huge campaign organization then comes up with 100 of these ideas, and you can't execute more than 20. How do you select? Pretty basic return on investment calculation stuff. How likely is this action to succeed, and what's the benefit? If it's like a 20% success, success for 100 persons not to vote, then you know you do, you do the math. And then when we're lying, it's of course very important to look at how big a failure is. So are you just losing that the uh, effort you spent, or you actually, or are you actually losing further credibility? Or are you actually maybe even helping the opposition if you fail? And uh, again, still more complexity. How this activity fits in with all of the other activities? So should we just focus on doing things in Florida and forget about all the other states and make sure we win there? And, and maybe there's an activity that gives you 20% chance on the same tar target population and another activity that gives you 10% chance, but if you do both, you're up to 50. So you need to go through all of these combinations of those 100 ideas to, to figure out which would be the, the 20 best. OK, so I think I've covered like at maximum two practical tips. So let's end with those. What you can do as an individual to not get triggered. They are not called emotional triggers for no reason. So don't be emotional. Try to stay analytical. B basic stuff. But being analytical can lead to like an analysis paralysis thing. That you always consider all the alternatives. You need to get more data. You don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. And then you're, even though you're trying to be super analytical, you're in the same state as you would be if you would be confused. So you need to stay active. 
And the only way to combine these two is to have like a plan and then drive that plan for always. So you decide what you're going to do and you keep doing that until your analysis really comes to a conclusion that you just change your plan. Now the fourth point is about understanding the world. Uh, I don't know if it's obvious, but it's quite difficult to trigger you with truthful information and sort of if you want to s sort of get you to do stupid things, it's, it's really hard if, if the information is truthful because then you're actually usually doing the right things. And, and, and your existing knowledge blocks out stuff that is not in agreement with. So if you have a very truthful and broad understanding of the world, if you have a good education, you simply disregard a lot of the lies and you're a very hard person to get triggered. So th this, this really helps. And uh, it's not enough just to understand the world, you need to understand also yourself. Uh, and the thing I see in this context as most important one is to understand your own values. Because if you're a human being and your values are attacked, it's going to feel emotional. You can't be so analytical without turning into like a robot that that wouldn't, you know, drive emotions in you. Uh, but if you understand your values, if you uh, know them, if you, s you don't need to write them down, but you sort of understand which sort of things are important for you, you are more easily uh, than able to detect when somebody on purpose tries to get you angry uh, and you will, you know, keep your cool. Because in a lot of cases, the first one to lose their cool is, is the one who is going to uh, lose the fight or lose the negotiation. And uh, this is also, uh, if you turn this around, this is also one of the ways you can most easily, I think, find those ways to get certain people triggered. I would say that a lot of people in this room are very sort of proud on how, uh, how much of an expert you're in, in your respective areas. And if somebody sort of insults or questions your expertise, that is likely one of the ways you could, tr you could be triggered. Uh, coming back to Mr. Trump, if you uh, question his successfulness, uh, I'm pretty sure that's like the prime trigger for that fellow. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Finland, Juha Sipila, has quite openly stated that he gets emotional if somebody uh, sort of talks about or attacks his children. So that would be, I think, a prime trigger candidate for, for him. And, and while, while Mr. Putin is somewhat of a tougher uh, nut to crack in this sense, I would expect that his sort of spying background and everything would, would make him pretty susceptible to uh, conspiracy theories, like of they're out to get you, paranoia type of things, that there's some faction in your government that is actually trying to overthrow you. And that would be the area that I would look into if, if I were to target him. But luckily, we still have those barriers. So as a society, we definitely need to have laws and the enforcement of those laws in place. So if somebody gets triggered, we have still, you know, systematic barriers for them on, on doing stupid things. But on a personal level, what you can do is build a habit of delays. And I constantly fail at this. I should not click that retweet button within the 30 seconds because I don't, you know, I don't have even time to check if the information was true. Uh, not to mention that I wouldn't, you know, make a con conscious decision that I'm not acting emotionally. But this is the, the prime things that you can do. Don't even share the information immediately. It doesn't matter if you're like 15 minutes late, but you're so much smarter in doing that than, than sharing immediately. So, in a lot of sense, these can be uh, summarized as both like keeping your cool and, and then education, education, education. And I would like to end on a notion, stay cool, stay in school. Thank you. I believe there's time for questions. Hi. Uh, you mentioned this uh, non, uh, uh, like uh, before elections that you shouldn't campaign. But yeah. uh, I don't know if it is it really that good because well, say like in the French presidential campaign, uh, there was a leak. Of course, the leak was caught and it failed miserably. But what if? Yeah. Well, it's 
as such, it's not like a perfect solution, but I think it's an area we should study in that could something like that, you know, improve the state. Uh, and, and in that case, it, it worked, but, you know, like you mentioned, we were lucky that it worked. Yeah, so not like a complete ban, but limited. Yeah, but some sort of mechanism. I haven't figured it out yet, but, but there could be solutions in, in that area. Thank you. Excellent talk. Should we actually call these methods propaganda? Use the name, because you mentioned it, that if you do this in an efficient way, you are repeating the message, trigger emotions, and uh, try to boost the ego of the target and make him do some forceful things, believe something that is not true entirely true. Isn't that like the usual definition of efficient propaganda? So should we use the word propaganda? I think that these, uh, these academics that study information warfare and, and information influence operation, operations and so on, they have pretty much given up on using the word propaganda since that definition got sort of uh, diluted. But a lot of these things could fit under that banner. But then again, we could have emotional triggering also in like a social engineering context where, where the propaganda sort of doesn't fit that well. And, and also I like to mention now that you brought that up is that, that not all social engineering is, is then emotional triggering either, but this sort of overlap or, or they have like a joint space in between. But many of the things that, that we discussed today is, is, is something that you could also call propaganda. Thanks. Hi, um, how do you filter um, non-factual information from, let's say, news sites or comment, comment sites where, um, without, appearing, uh, without appearing elitist or holier than those who don't know so much about why it was rejected? Because I, I think that if it's just a black box, like, information goes in and maybe comes out, it may, like, uh, seem unfair to those people who don't know as much, and I think it might need more transparency. So do you mean that uh, how should a, a media company, for example, filter some of the stuff that comes in uh, so that they would not seem biased? Or Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we're probably not never ever going to be able to, to get rid of that, because even if, if all of those people who sort of believe in the truth and want the truth to prevail would accept that algorithm, there's always somebody that's, who is trying to attack that and is going to question that, how it works. But on a level of will people accept an algori algorithm to do that weeding out for them, uh, I think it was like 60% of Americans who trust Facebook for their news which is basically already filtered information. So at least there's like a history of, of people accept, accepting a, a algorithmic decision on, on what this is uh, fed to them as information. All right, thanks. Uh, hi, thanks for a good talk. Um, I wanted to ask about context. Context is for kings. Facts are absolute, but truth is relative. How do you, how do you work with that? Everything is relative. Everything is about the context. Uh, Bush seemed the worst president possible, but compared to Trump. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've understood that a lot of the work, sort of what separate uh, the good journalists from the bad ones is really sort of bringing in this idea of context and, and sort of also admitting that you're only providing a perspective on things that you can never sort of give out every single piece of fact. Uh, and, you know, it's also a big question. Maybe I'll, you know, need to do a talk on <laughs> a year from now on that. So I don't, don't have like a full answer, but I think it's a very relevant question and it's, it's very hard uh, to make sure that that context is always delivered along with the facts so that the facts can be understood and, and put into a, a coherent uh, view of the world. Uh, 
you mentioned that it's important not to be too emotional, but also not too analytical, so you don't go to this paralysis. How can you find this balance? When do you realize, okay, now I'm like overdoing this? Well, uh, like I mentioned, the key is really to have this plan-based approach, so that you're not just going from moment to moment. You make a decision on, on, on acting on, on, on some information, and then you sort of have the default of, of, of continuing along that path until you have enough new information to really, really steer away from that, so you would not react to every impulse. That you, it, it's also sort of like a habit of delay type of thing, but I think that is, that is really a, a key in, in combining these. And, and from a, a truth perspective, it would not actually be a problem to disregard the emotions altogether, but then from like a human life perspective, that would be pretty catastrophic. <laughs> Okay, thanks one again.